hello and welcome to our service for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, coming to you from Trinity Episcopal Church in Lumberton, North Carolina. service begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five and one household will be divided, three against two, two against three, they will be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it's going to rain, so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. What does it cost us to go to church when we want to give evidence of our faith in that way? I've been wondering lately what people would say if we asked them that. A free Sunday morning, a chance to sleep in, the 10 or 20 bucks that maybe that they put in the offering plate. Odds are if we stop to think of it, it costs us very little to be a Christian today, even in this increasingly post-Christian culture, going to church is no longer quite the norm, at least causes little comment. Not so, of course, in Jesus' day. As Jesus indicates in this complicated and sort of off-putting passage, those who followed him were regularly thrust into conflict and division, often with their own family members. To follow Jesus, you see, was to question the religious and economic and even political status quo. If you were Jewish, it meant accepting as the Messiah this itinerant rabbi who hung out with the disreputable, accepted sinners and preached a message of love, forgiveness. It meant that accepting as Messiah one who looked almost nothing like the warrior David that they had expected. And if he were Gentile, it meant accepting as Messiah this itinerant rabbi who hung out with the disreputable, accepted sinners and preached a message of love and forgiveness. It also meant that is accepting as Messiah one who looked almost nothing like but the culture held out as powerful or important. Moreover, following Jesus meant not merely adopting new beliefs, but a new way of living. To be a follower of the one who accepted and even honored the disreputable people meant that you needed to do the same rejecting the easy temptation of judging others and instead inviting them into your life. To be a follower of the one who preached love and forgiveness was to practice these things, particularly when it comes to those who differ from us, even, maybe especially in terms of what they believe. I began this Discussion noting a major difference between Jesus' day and our own as naming yourself a Christian had a much greater societal cost and even personal risk associated with it then as it does now. But I wonder about that, and I wonder if we might also find ourselves thrust into conflict and division with those that we care about if we welcomed into our homes and congregations and social circles, those whom society shuns. 
What would be the reaction of our family and friends and co-workers if we really acted like Jesus did? Across the Old Testament, the purifying fire Jesus seems to reference here is most often associated with the fire that burns away impure religious practices. Not impure as in not liturgically correct, but rather impure in that they tended to make religion a source of false comfort, right religious practice and beliefs. Too many, I thought, over the centuries should exempt you from the suffering or disaster or poverty or even death that is all around you. And I think in this regard, little has changed. Think, for instance, of the popular Christian obsession with accepting Jesus into your heart as the means by which to escape eternal punishment and secure an eternal reward. But what if faith wasn't about guaranteeing future bliss, but was rather an invitation to live differently, to see those around us now, neither as souls to be saved or threats to be deterred, but rather to see them, to see everyone as God's children, to be loved and honored and cared for. Or perhaps closer to home in this election season, think of how routine it has become for political candidates to close every speech with God bless America yet throughout the biblical witness, blessing always comes with an expectation, even an obligation to extend that blessing to others. America has been blessed in many ways, and from those who have been given much, much also is expected. So what would it cost a candidate to close speeches with God bless America so that America can be a blessing to the world. Faith leads to action, or should. It's not the guarantee of future bliss. If you read on in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, faith is not all hunky-dory. Speaking of the early church, the writer of Hebrews says, Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went around in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And yet, by the power of their faith, they endured, they endured persecution. They kept on in spite of the odds. They kept on against the odds, swimming upstream. And then in a burst of glory in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, the writer says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings to us so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. How do we do that? Looking to Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and is taken up at the right hand of the throne of God. Keep the faith. And that faith will keep you. But it's not easy. The late Harry Emerson Fosdick, arguably one of the greatest preachers of our time, once said this. He said, the world has two ways of getting rid of Jesus. The first is by crucifying him. The second is by worshiping him without following him. There's a lot of truth in that. In one sense, it's pretty easy to worship Jesus on Sunday. 
But it's something else to follow Jesus out there in the world on Monday. As I said earlier, it's easy to be a member of the church in America. All you basically have to do is show up. It's like Woody Allen said, half of life is just showing up. In America, you can be a member of a church just by showing up and filling out the membership card and answering the altar call or visiting the pastor, and the new member committee. It's not complicated, but discipleship in community is a much more difficult and demanding proposition. Discipleship is about following Jesus, living by his teachings, what he actually taught, and by living in the spirit of his very life. And that's not easy. If you don't believe me, just think for a moment. It's easy to worship on Sunday, but it's tough to follow him on Monday. Think for a moment. Think about what we call Holy Week. As far as I can tell, all the disciples were present and accounted for on Palm Sunday. It's easy to worship on Sunday. And they were all there. It was simple. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was easy. Hosanna in the highest. It's easy just to show up on church on Sunday. But on Monday, where are those same disciples? Tuesday, Wednesday, where was Judas by Wednesday or Thursday? After the dinner in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, let this cup pass from me. Where are they now? Where were they when he was arrested? Where were they when he was on trial? Where were they when he was lynched and hung on a cross? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? It's easy to worship, but it's tough to follow. Membership in the church is easy, but discipleship in the community of the church is another matter because, see, what the world looks down on and considers wretched, Jesus calls blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek and the humble. Blessed are the merciful and the compassionate. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst that God's righteous justice might prevail. Blessed are those who make for peace. Blessed are you who are persecuted just because you stood for love, because you showed compassion, because you lived for justice, because you walk a different way. Blessed are you. It's tough to follow Jesus, but following this way of love and forgiving and compassion, it is the way of life. But you can't do it without faith. The theologian Paul Tillich, in his book, The Courage to Be, taught us that faith is the daring act of courage. It is the courage to affirm being in spite of the threat of non-being, courage to affirm life in spite of death, courage to affirm hope in spite of despair, the courage to stand up and to speak up when everyone else just shuts up. It's not proof. It's not certainty. It's not an insurance policy, but it's got power. Power that is born of a God who gives it. We've come this far by faith, says the song leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He's never failed me yet. And in the words of an old hymn, oh, for a faith that will not shrink, oppressed by many a foe, that will not totter at the brink of any earthly woe. In the words of presiding Bishop Michael Curry, keep the faith. Keep the faith when you feel like it and keep it when you don't. Keep the faith. Keep the faith when you think you know what you're doing and keep it when you don't. Keep the faith on the mountaintop of exaltation. Keep the faith in the valley of humiliation. You keep the faith in the God who has faith in you, who has given you life because he has faith in you. And that faith will keep you 
God will bless you. Keep the faith. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.